right. And again, there's this um, scene at the end where America Ferrer's daughter says, you know, your drawings are great. She's like, they're weird and twisted, just like you. Like, we're all weird and twisted. And I think the reason why weird Barbie is up on that hill, like you have to climb the mountain to go see her, is because we don't want to see that in ourselves. Mm. Well, and I actually would argue that weird Barbie and Kate McKinnon's character, to me, is the most... I thought it was the most authentic of our everyday lives, even more so than, and this is probably going to be a hot take, but I thought America Ferrera's character, like I understood where I love America Ferrera. So it's not her acting, but I thought the way that her character is written, I could have used more. Want to listen to this Ivory Tower Boiler Room or True Crime and Academia episode ad-free? Head on over to our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room to listen to all of our podcast episodes without any ads. You get access to our video episodes, our bonus episodes, and even more exclusive content, including merchandise. It only starts at $5 a month, so head on over to our Patreon. Again, it's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash ivory tower boiler room. And while you're at it, you know what would be such a help is if you could rate and review the ivory tower boiler room on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and make sure that you follow us and share out our podcast to all of your friends. It truly does help. And I want to thank you all. It means so much that you're listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. If you're listening to this on the podcast and you're not watching on Patreon, you are missing out because I'm sitting here with my guest and we have the beautiful film poster behind us. And just to let you know, if you're watching the video, we may disappear once in a while, but we are not sacrificing the beautiful Malibu LA type setting that we have in Barbie land. So without further ado, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I'm so excited to be doing this in person with Chena Rubino. Hi. I think I said your last name right. You got it right. Good. Okay. So Sheena, I met at LA Fitness when I did a yoga class and she is just such a wonderful, I remember yoga teacher and instructor, but I'd love you to fill everyone in on where you're coming from, like what work you do and just like how you're checking in when we start to discuss the Barbie movie. Sure. Um, so I recently became an Ayurvedic doula, a birthing doula, kind of like for those of you who don't know, sort of like a midwife. And I also teach women wellness. So coming from a place of womb wisdom. And I am really excited, and I'm going to go into more depth about what that means. There was a lot of that throughout the movie, and I'm just really excited to talk about it. Yeah, well, I'm so excited that you're here, and this is the first part of a two-part Barbie series. So we're getting the womb wisdom, feminine energy. We're going to, I'm going to dive a lot with Sheena into gender and If you don't know, I'm sure a lot of you out there know, but I have a grad certificate in women's gender sexuality studies. Um, You know, my work is very more queer and sexuality focused, but I definitely re-watching this with, you know, knowing we're going to record Sheena had so much more moments that I caught that I really like needed to digest and unpack with you. So, you know, thank you for joining me. And right away, what do you make out of the opening sequence? Because I still am trying to work my head around like all the girls playing with the outdated Barbie dolls as if they're cave people. Wow, there's there's a lot to unpack in this movie. So I think the opening scene comes from when feminism was first presented to us, right? Like they say in the movie, girls have always had dolls, but they only ever had babies. That was their only option, right? Yeah. So here comes along feminism. Now they have this beautiful 
blonde, Barbie, that can be anything, right? So now they have these options. So this is the beginning of the pendulum that's about to swing. And just like anything, when that pendulum swings, it comes from one direction and goes way into the other direction. And we see that. And then we see, you know, the next scene is going into Barbie land where the narrator says, this is where all of the problems of feminism have been fixed. <laughs> Everything is perfect here, right? So um, I just loved it. I loved, I loved so much about the movie. I cried several times. And that's my interpretation of the opening scene. Well, so I should have even asked you, how much before this movie did you know, like through your own studies, especially with like what you do as like now you're going into the doula work and you're going into, remind me the pronunciation, but the healing. Ayurveda. Thank you. And what is Ayurveda healing? So Ayurveda is the sister science of yoga. It is the original form of holistic medicine that we know of. It's at least 5,000 years old or older. Um, and it deals with mind-body medicine and using your body type because everyone has a different body type. There's three main, we call them doshas. Um, we call them vata, pitta, kapha. Most people would probably understand them as endomorph, ectomorph, and mesomorph. I think more people are familiar with that, but it's similar to that. Um, and it's about how your mind and your body are connected and your daily routine can dictate your health. Yeah, well, and I love that because I really, from this movie, even like that beginning, what you're already unpacking with um, trying to digest the older forms of how women were seen as almost baby making machines and like a pejorative you know in a negative the film is presenting us more with that like 1950s housewife I feel really going against that strain of what it meant to be a woman and what it meant to even um not have agency over your body and your choices so I think like with your mind and body experience and how you're integrating that into the movie I think what I see in the movie, Sheena, is more like Greta Gerwig, the director. I feel like there's a lot of theory, like she's working with a lot of feminist theory. And how much have you been exposed or have you read of feminist theory? Because like, I think it's interesting, like those who might have known a lot about the different debates in feminism throughout the ages, and then those who didn't, but what they got out of the opening. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of jump right into this. I I haven't studied feminism. Um, and I will say, I personally don't feel any type of pressures from the patriarchy, that's what you wanna call it. And I don't really relate to any feminine ideologies. And I think my personal opinion, and this might be a little bit controversial, I think some of them can be quite toxic. I think ideas are liberating ideologies can be toxic. And that whole, again, just jumping right into it, that whole middle scene mm -hmm. where America Ferreira is saying, you know, women have to be pretty, but not too pretty so that you're threatening and you have to be thin, but not too thin. You have to say that you want to be yeah. healthy. We have it put up in front of us. Do you want to read? You can, you can read. Well, it. how about the, well, you mentioned the thin part. So do you want to read that section? Okay. So you have to be thin, but not too thin. And you can never say you want to be thin. You have to say you want to be healthy, but also you have to be thin. <laughs> you have to have money, but you can't ask for money because that's crass. You have to be a boss. You can't be mean. You have to lead, but you can't squash other people's ideas, right? Yeah. And here, here is my problem with that. Who put these ideologies on women? Hmm. I'm going to say other women, other feminine ideologies. And that's that's my perspective of that. And that's what I think would happen with this pendulum, right? There was a purpose for it. In the very beginning, there was a purpose for it because women didn't have a choice. And that was important. We needed that choice. Women didn't have credit cards until the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so we needed feminism. It had its purpose. But then all of these other ideologies came in, and I believe that it was from other women saying to other women, well, you can't do that. We worked so hard to get to this point. 
And I just think that what has happened is that women have lost touch with what I call their womb wisdom. And I truly, truly feel, and we also see how the patriarchy affects men as well. So, and the patriarchy is not, I don't believe it's men's fault, right? Because men do suffer from this too. And we see that in the movie with everything that Ken goes through. And we can circle back to that. But what happened was somewhere along the lines, women had to become like men to survive. And we're just not like men. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I'm so excited to shout out the Gay and Lesbian Review, who is helping to sponsor the ITBR podcast. For all of you out there, the Gay and Lesbian Review is a bi-monthly magazine where you can discover new things about gay and lesbian literature, history, and culture. And the GL Review publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies, and a number of special features, such as artist profiles and their popular art memo column. Each issue of the magazine brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought-provoking articles focused on a unifying theme. For example, their September-October issue centers on the theme, Cracking the Closet. So, starting in the 19th century, a number of artists and writers found ways to crack the closet by expressing their sexuality between the lines or in the interstices of their work. For example, Ignacio Darnad, who is a friend of the ITBR podcast, he's been on our show, writes all about illustrator J.C. Leyendecker, whose work for Ivory Soap and Arrow Collars gave him plenty of opportunities to draw pictures of well-dressed and at times scantily dressed American men. And you also can find an article by Vernon Rosario, who has been on the podcast, and he talks about the quest for sex in the Middle Ages. So to subscribe, visit glreview.org, that's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W.org. Click subscribe. So on their website, go all the way over to the right-hand side and you'll see the button subscribe. Click subscribe and enter the promo code ITBR50 because you're getting 50% off your subscription to the print or digital edition of the Gay and Lesbian Review magazine. I can't wait for you all to have your copy of the Gay and Lesbian Review magazine and make sure that you take a picture when your magazine arrives or when you're reading it online and tag the GL Review on Instagram and ITBR and we'll share it out in our stories. Enjoy your reading, everyone. So this is like the corporate, almost if you think of Hillary Clinton, like the businesswoman, how they're ha- they're entering into corporate spaces that they're needing to act in that dominant way to get ahead, but not necessarily, because I've heard this with those who even argue um, in feminist spaces, there's argue, argument, Sheena, about that kind of model you're talking about, that women necess- that sometimes the women who do rise in a workplace are not necessarily bringing up other women or empowering them, that it feels like they're clawing their way to the top, and that sometimes men are being more supportive in the workplace to women. And again, it's not like I'm condoning, like I'm saying that's exactly what's happening all the time. Because like you said, this is going to be controversial, but I think it's important to lay it out because um, as someone who's, I've studied a lot of feminism, I think that there's so many debates in those who study feminism of even what it means. And a lot of those who even study feminism don't call themselves feminists. It's like, you know, myself, I'm a gay man. And like, I would not profess to know what it's like to be a woman. And at the same time, though, I think that, right, the movie is set when Ruth Handler is making Barbie. It's in the 1950s to 60s. So like we are in, I would say, I think it's the end of the 50s into the early 60s. But 
Rhea Perlman is Ruth Handler. So like, you don't necessarily know that watching the movie, but she is the inventor of Barbie, is the woman by herself in the kitchen that Margot Robbie's character meets. And it's fascinating to me because it's a woman who creates this ideal, stereotypical, blonde, long-legged woman that then feminists actually have so many critiques of when Barbie comes out. So like there is a backlash even to the Barbie doll being introduced from women, but it's actually supposed to be a positive from Ruth Handler when she creates it. Like she thinks that this is actually going to help empower women to have this doll out there. So I feel, you know, did you play with Barbie dolls? Like, is this something you related to? Of course, to? I was Barbie. <laughs> For those of you, and I, you know, you knew me back when, I had platinum blonde hair from, I mean, I was dyeing my hair as early <laughs> as possible. From the time I was like 12 or 14 years old, I only stopped dyeing it about two years ago. But I have been called Barbie. I have identified with the Barbie archetype for most of my life. Um, you know, the only thing I was ever told was that I was pretty. And, you know, like I was like a Barbie. I was pretty and nice. And Barbie even has a moment like that in the movie. She's like, I'm not anything. Like, I'm not President Barbie. I'm not, you know, the Nobel Prize winner Barbie. I'm not the Dr. Barbie. I'm just stereotypical Barbie. And let me tell you, I could relate to that throughout most of my life until, you know, I got a little bit older. But, you know, she even says, she sits there and she's like, I'm just going to wait for someone else to fix this until she reaches deep down and finds that, again, what I call medicine mother or womb wisdom within herself, you know, and she's talking with Ruth Handler and she's like, look at what you did. What do you mean you're not good enough? And even in that moment, she's like, no, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. It was them. They did that, you know? So I, of course, identify with Barb. <laughs> and I also think that there's nothing wrong with that, you know, like a lot of, um, you know, in, in today's world, we give the the pretty woman some, can I curse on here? Oh yeah, you can <laughs> curse. Yeah, you can say whatever you want. Pretty women, like some bullshit. Like, why are you just going to be pretty? Like, why don't you get out to the workforce? Why would you just want to be a mother? And that's also, again, kind of what America Ferreira gets at at the end. She's like, what about the, the, the gen, I forget what she calls it, but the general Barbie. That just, she just is. Maybe she's a mom, maybe she's not, you know? And again, that was Ruth Handler's idea was that Barbie could be anything. But there's this there's this backlash. Why? Why is there this backlash? You know? Well, and I'll bring it up because I think it's important. The Barbie, the stereotypical Barbie, the one that first came out, she did have blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, and it's so interesting because just to plug an upcoming book, but Renee Rosen, who came on this podcast, Sheena, she um, did a novel about Estee Lauder's life that you can listen to an interview I did called Fifth Avenue Glamour Girl. And she's actually right now writing the Ruth Handler novel about why Ruth Handler created Barbie. So I can't wait for that to come out. But Ruth Handler was Jewish. And it's so interesting to me that then the image that we get is this like Aryan you know, um, like almost the white race. And that can be seen in a very negative way about the blonde hair and blue eyes. But there is something to the woman stereo, this female stereotype of a Pamela Anderson, a very, if a woman has blonde hair and blue eyes, somehow that they're ditzy and unintelligent. And like Margot Robbie's character even feeds into that stereotype, even though the word she's saying and the wisdom she carries is so profound. Like the things that she's just talking about, she's so, well, she's the first one to bring up death and the existence of life. And she has these philosophical questions that none of the other Barbies or the Kens are bringing up, but it's seen as a negative for her to think about existential questions, right? Because that's not what happens in Barbie land. Barbie land is supposed to be a paradise of pleasure all the time. Like things are all solved for them. Yeah. And I love it because there's this point where, you know, she's like, no, every day is perfect, you know, but that's where, listen, baby girl, this is where the growth happens, you know, 
this is, you know, to go from what I call maiden to mother, you know, maiden is like girlhood, mother, not necessarily meaning that you have to birth the child, but mothering ideas, which at the end of the movie is what she wants to do, right? She wants to become human and she wants to be the one to create the ideas. You can't stay in that maiden archetype forever. And I mean, people do, don't get me wrong, people do, men and women stay in that child frame of mind. But, you know, I believe to really grow as a person and evolve your spirit requires requires that pain and that growth and that confusion. Yeah, so I don't want to let this drop because you did mention our big keyword patriarchy, which like mm -hmm. if you study an intro to gender studies course or feminist studies, patriarchal constructions is like the number one jargon term. Like you're going to hear about the patriarchy in all different forms of feminism and like when Ruth Handler's creating Barbie, that's when the feminine mystique comes out by Betty Friedan. And then Gloria Steinem, like even goes undercover as a um, a playboy bunny. Like she like gets inside the playboy bunny's head when she's a journalist. And like, that's the moment where they're fighting against the housewife stereotype. Like women can have a career, right? Like that was the sixties or seventies is like women can have a career. They can have sexual freedom. And like you're saying, there was a lot of strides. Like you're not saying women didn't have strides from that. At the same time, I'm so glad you didn't mention because I do bring this up and I think we don't have enough conversations about it. Men are impacted by the patriarchy. Like if you want to call it the patriarchy, yeah. men are impacted by not having as much, many conversations about the depth of their emotions, their friend groups, like, you know, that if they are seen as vulnerable, that's not a positive, like that there is this tough exterior men are supposed to have in this system. So, you know, some will say, Shana, but Shana, feminism argues right now that, you know, if men join the feminist circle, they will benefit, like patriarchy will right. then end for them. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I am so excited to be talking about Broadview Press. You might be asking, what is Broadview Press, Andrew? Broadview is an independent academic publisher in the humanities that produces high quality, pedagogically useful books for use in university and college classrooms. They publish in the humanities, mainly English studies, writing, philosophy, and history, just to name a few genres, and recently, I had on Dr. Jason Holt, who wrote all about the philosophy of sport. And what better summer episode than to talk about what happens when a philosopher dissects the beautiful aesthetics of sporting culture. In the spring, I had on Drs. Kyle Stedman and Tanya Rodriguez to talk about what is sound writing, how to make audio projects in the college classroom, how to even have your students create podcasts. And then in the winter, I had on Dr. E Dr. Jeffrey Weinstock. He talked about analyzing pop culture. Yes, I even sneak in some Real Housewives questions. And how to teach composition and make it fun. He uses this whole metaphor about being a mad scientist in this gothic lab. And in the fall, I had on Dr. Ann Stevens, and she talked about literary theory and criticism. And yes, the university season is upon us. So what better way to talk about the college classroom than to actually understand what is literary theory? That's a wonderful episode for all of you out there who teach literary studies. I love Broadview Press. Make sure you use their exclusive code. It's Ivory Tower on broadviewpress.com. You get 20% off all, all Broadview Press publications. Okay, until the next Broadview Press interview. And now back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. So, yeah. well, here's the thing, though, right? It needs to be both mm -hmm. because we see the damage that happens from the matriarchy, right? Ken is, let's look at Ken. Yeah. I think he's so sweet. I love him. <laughs> I love his character. So Ken is not happy in the matriarchy, right? And Barbie ends up leaving him because he is a product of the matriarchy. She chooses the real world, right? And so you can see how men are hurting women, but since we're talking about men right now, how men are hurting in the matriarchy in Barbie land and also how they're hurting in the patriarchy in the real world. 
So, um, and you can see that with Ken when he turns Barbie land into a patriarchy. So he puts on this really hard exterior, right? He's got his, his Rocky Balboa mink on and he's even wearing like his boxing gloves and all of his watches. And he has this point where, you know, like he's, he's overtaken the land, right? Mm -hmm. and, but he yells out, he says, no, you failed me, Barbie. And he breaks down. So because he felt powerless in the matriarchy, it's the pendulum again, right? The pendulum swung in the other way and he created this toxic, true, a true toxic patriarchy. But he was hurting there too. Because the minute Barbie feels destroyed and he sees how he has hurt her with his, I'll, I hate this term, but I'm going to use it because it's, it's, it's appropriate for this scene. He's using his toxic masculinity to overpower her. But he sees her pain and he sees that he caused that. And then that's when he puts on his sunglasses because he's about to cry because he sees what he's done. So I don't believe that if men were to join a matriarchy that that would solve the problems either. I think it's both. I think it's men coming into their their true power and as the masculine and women coming into their true power as the feminine, the womb wisdom. And we work together in those masculine and feminine energies. And as you know, men and women both, they possess both masculine and feminine energies. But just to talk about, you know, in the general sense, it's about balance. Yeah. So Ken only has a good day if Barbie says hello to him. That's what Helen Mirren says in the voiceover as the narrator. So like you're saying, you've met, so you've now coined Barbie land as a matriarchy system. And I find that interesting because I think some reactions to the movie are like saying, oh no, like Greta Gerwig is doing a thought experiment of what would it be like if women held all the power and now the men needed to be admired and gazed at by women. And like, it's now the shoe is on the other foot because that's what women have to go through on their day-to-day -day basis is being catcalled when they go for a run or always being seen as the object of possession. Again, I'm like just doing, yeah. you know, creating a really narrow stereotype. But it's like, you hear that all the time. Like women are seen as the sex object, but now the men need admiration from the women. And if not, Ken has a negative day because Barbie hasn't acknowledged him. Right. You know, is this... To you, though, is that what a matriarchal system would be? Or this really is just satire? Like, this is just for comedic purposes. Well, of course, yeah. It's an it's an idea, and it's, like, overdramatic, you know? Like you said, it's... I think there's a double meaning to a lot of it. Um, what I think a true matriarchy would look like, and I can take... Um, if it's okay, I can apply my doula studies into this. Because yeah, there's a lot of... Um, things that you'll see in nature. So in a true matriarchy, the male provides, the female decides. So if we lived in a matriarchal society, like there's been stories of that in um, some certain tribes. So saying the male provides. So a lot of the times the male would, you know, maybe get some food for the tribe, but the female decides who gets what. So she kind of distributes. Mm -hmm. And you can even see this on a biological level. So when a woman is pregnant, so there are, um, and the baby's in the placenta, right? The male genetics decide how much blood comes into the placenta, but the female genetics decide when it stops. So the male is providing this nutrient and the blood flow, but the female, because you can have too much, right? Too much is too much. You could have too much of anything, but the female genetics cut it off when enough is enough. So there is, and you can't have one without the other. And energetically, you know, in our, our yoga world, I know you're wanting to talk about politics and I'm just constantly bringing back, bringing it back to the spiritual. No, you're fine. No, I like that. No, <laughs> yeah, no. But that's just how my, that's how my world is. Um, I had a train of thought. I lost it before I was making that point. But yeah, the male provides the female decision. You're saying in like, even in the reproduction, mm -hmm. the female, the body's deciding is what you're saying. Like the male there's a purpose for the the male, I'm trying to get the right word, but um, genet in the genetic way, the male genetics has a purpose, but the female genetics, it really is the final say. Like I the mean, woman does have the final. And think of it in a heterosexual mm -hmm. relationship. I mean, you know, 
the women out there who are with their man, you can you can attest if you tell your your husband, your partner, your boyfriend, uh, babe, can you do this for me? Nine times out of ten, they're like, yeah, <laughs> you know, like typically in a heterosexual relationship, the male provides, the female decides. When she decides that this is what she wants, this is the proper way to go. Usually, the man will provide that for her, and it's a very important relationship. Yeah. So you're saying a matriarchal system. You're not arguing that it couldn't exist, like it couldn't have a positive. Do you think that the patriarchy is inherently negative or should we just be thinking outside of these gendered concepts? Like, should we even just do away with thinking about patriarchy and matriarchy and just like have a balanced system? Like, what is that term for just when there's a gendered system that operates in balance? Nature. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to call it. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's like this power struggle. And I think that I think that um most of society is a little bit lost and out of touch with nature and balance. Um, and their true their true innate heart's desire. Because again, if we're talking about um a heterosexual relationship, the male finds um accomplishment in providing whatever it is that his woman wants. Yeah. They do. They feel a sense of that, you know, it's what a good, healthy man wants to do, you know, and then you can also, again, to take it back to the movie, you can see when an unhealthy and when an unhealthy man wants to take that power from the woman. And there's even the scene where um, America Ferrer's daughter says, everyone hates women, like men hate women, women hate women. But what hate is at the at the bottom, you know, at the end of the day is just fear. And it's because women, women really are quite powerful and quite intuitive. And it's fear. Well, and something that, especially with patriarchal systems, I'm thinking of naming, like how last names traditionally are carried, you know, by the husband. So like there's the male lineage by your last name, but something that in Barbie land, everyone is a Barbie or Ken. There are no like, they might have designated Weird Barbie as Kate McKinnon's character. Oh, I love, by the way. Yeah, which we have to talk about. Because I actually, this is actually my critique of the film, is you brought up heterosexuality. And I'm going to talk more on part two with a queer theorist about, like, the, you know, sexual complexities. But we do have a Weird Barbie. Like, we even, Alan is also kind of discarded. So it's not like there is no power there is a power difference in Barbie land. It isn't utopic. Like it isn't a spread out system. There's bullying. I mean, why is weird Barbie up on that hill? Like why are the discarded Barbies all together? Like there's the sugar daddy Barbie, the like disco drug fueled earring magic can. Um, I loved it. I yeah. Loved it. But I guess you could argue, oh, they were discarded by Mattel, but they still are seen as less than by the Barbies and the cats. So, you, and even pregnant Barbie was described oh, yeah. tell, which we'll circle back to that. But what I think that that um, represents, you know, Weird Barbie is up on the hill. And the minute I saw her, I went to see the movie with my girlfriend. She and I looked at each other and we both go, that's me! Like, because everybody can relate with Weird Barbie because we all have that, like, weirdness or, like, the shadows within us, right? And again, there's this um, scene at the end where America Ferrer's daughter says, you know, your drawings are great. She's like, they're weird and twisted, just like you. Like we're all weird and twisted. And I think the reason why Weird Barbie is up on that hill, like you have to climb the mountain to go see her is because we don't want to see that in ourselves. Mm. Well, and I actually would argue that Weird Barbie and Kate McKinnon's character to me is the most, I thought it was the most authentic of our everyday lives. Even more so than, and this is probably going to be a hot take, but I thought America Ferrera's character, like, I understood where, I love America Ferrera, so it's not her acting, but I thought the way that her character is written, I could have used more. Like, I, I could have used more out of that storyline, but this is, like, my own critique of the film is I didn't like Will Ferrell. Like, I had no idea. It, I was just, like, the whole Mattel CEO it was very, I thought it would actually be effective if it was a female comedian who had played the Mattel CEO, that it could have like added this other layer of complicated feminist ideals of like, oh, well, you know, 
you're malfunctioning, Barbie. You need to be discard. Like you need to go back and I need to reprogram you. Hi everyone, this is Andrew and I am interrupting what I know is such an exciting Ivory Tower Boiler Room episode to tell you all about one of my favorite podcasts. It's called That Old Gay Classic Cinema and it's hosted by Christian Garcia. Christian is joined with guest co-hosts to talk about classic cinema films that we know and love and he analyzes them through a queer lens. So He's talked about The Sound of Music, Alfred Hitchcock, The Wizard of Oz, Sleeping Beauty, 101 Dalmatians, and recently, Hello, Dolly. I actually was on his first ever episode to talk about my love of The Sound of Music and playing Captain Von Trapp in my high school musical. Then I was joined with Mary DePippi, the host of True Crime in Academia, and our friend Travis Roundtree to talk about Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. Mary just had Christian on True Crime and Academia to talk about female poisoners, including the evil queen from Snow White and actual real life female poisoners. So Christian's podcast is the best. You must add it to your listen list. After you listen to this episode, make sure you head over to That Old Gay Classic Cinema on Apple and Spotify. Make sure you follow him on Instagram at That Old Gay Classic Cinema. And he's also on TikTok. Don't forget TikTok. Okay. I can't wait for you all to listen to That Old Gay Classic Cinema. And now back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. that it it did, I did think they're hitting us over the head with the patriarchal crisis in a very, none of you are up to speed on this. So I'm going to show you now what it's like when you have a bumbling idiot of a CEO who's a man who decides all of this. Like I understood the satire, but Yeah, it wasn't as nuanced as I thought it could be. Well, again, so with Will Ferrell, I think the importance there is like, you can again see how the patriarchy is hurting men. He says at the end, he's like, I just want somebody to tickle me. (laughs) He's like, I don't want to be so in charge all the time because um, women are really great at making decisions too. Sometimes, um, no offense, Bella, sometimes more so. Sometimes we're we're a little bit better at making decisions. Not always, again. Um, But, you know, you see how he's hurting in the patriarchy yeah and how did you feel like let's return to mitch like midge is always even from the beginning with the song pink by lizzo which i absolutely want to talk about the soundtrack because to me that's like the highlight like the under the unsung hero is literally the music like i think the music is actually as powerful as the storyline um and i loved margot robbie who i'm not always like wasn't always keyed in on, but I thought she really, the performances I thought were all very good. Will Ferrell, I just, it's not him. I, I I wish there was a little more to whatever was happening with the CEO, but you know, that's on another, we can get into that later. But what is going on with Mitch? Like, why is she being put down all the time? Like even the CEO says, Oh, Midge, I thought we got rid of you. Pregnant Barbie? Yeah. Right, that's Midge. Yeah. So in the very beginning, in the opening scene where they show Midge, pregnant Barbie, um, the narrator says, oh, she was discontinued because having a pregnant doll is too weird. So again, I think that has to do with feminine ideologies and the pendulum swinging way too far to think like women can be anything, but not, not pregnant. <laughs> they have to go out into the workforce. They have to chase their dreams. And that is where this pressure comes from. Like, I have to be something, you know? But, and then again, at the very end, what is the message? Ruth Handler says, life is complicated, that we make ideas up in our head to deal with it, like patriarchy, like Barbie. And then when she wants Barbie to close her eyes and feel, Mm -hmm. what do they show? They show images of babies and mamas and grandmamas. And they don't show women in the office. What they're just showing is love. (laughs) You know, well, and think about that exchange of how so many got their Barbies. It was from their mothers or their parents or the guardian in their life. Like, I mean, I played with Barbies and acted out all these scenarios. And it's when you're children, right? It's that imaginative space 
Um, which is why I think the opening sequence with the girls, again, it is interesting. They're all girls. There isn't a boy playing with a Barbie. Again, yeah. that is, that is, I will say they are making a statement. Why isn't there a boy playing with a Barbie in the beginning? Again, but is that just, are they trying to just show? I've also heard the take like from my thoughts, Sheena, like some have said, Andrew, can't you just allow, like this is for women to shine this film. It's not supposed to show the com complicated nature of men. But my feeling is right now in our culture, I think that's what we're struggling with is, you know, what does it mean to empower, especially the young generation of men, women, um, and different sexualities and just how do we all come together? Like, how do you all find, you even said it, your authentic self. Like, I believe right now in our authentic passions. And um, yeah, I don't know. Did you think about why are they all girls at the beginning? Personally, no, I didn't. I see from your perspective why you would um, have that thought process. And, you know, Andrew, hearing you talk, you know, on your podcast a few times, I get, I have this idea that, gay men are probably, um, I'm just kind of taking a shot in the dark, are probably going through similar transitions that women have gone through and are going through, like finding your sexuality, you know, um, how do you express it? Why aren't you represented in all of these ways, right? Like Barbie was only represented as the blonde. And now that now we came up with all of these other different representations and that's great and that's beautiful. But some, um, again, I, ideas are, great and liberating ideologies can be toxic so when you take barbie as an ideology thinking that the stereotypical barbie is bad right well then what about the girls who do look that way does that mean that that they have to be dumb and over sexualized no so i think that perhaps and you can correct me if i'm wrong maybe the the gay community or gay men specifically are kind of going through similar shifts no i would agree with you and again i'm not arguing that there should have you know as a directorial issue i'm not saying there should have been boys at the beginning i'm just again right my whole process with you sheena is just to point out the absences because i think sometimes the ab absences just help us analyze in this gendered way and like think about well i'm sure there was a reason because i feel in this film there was a reason for every gender yeah. every gender decision had a reason like nothing was done by chance like even alan I've heard, well, Andrew, there is a gay male character. It's Alan. And I'm like, I rewatched the film again. And I'm like, well, it's not completely made clear. Like there is no, I don't, there is no partnered gay relationship. Like, yes, there are queer male characters, like the sugar daddy, the earring magic, Alan, if you want to argue that. But it is interesting to me. Something missing though from the whole film is there is no love dynamic. This is a film without partnering like there is no sex there is no like making out really unless I'm forgetting a scene mm -hmm. but it really is showing us what does culture look like without partnering maybe that's why Midge is so taboo because she had sex to have the baby and maybe. sex is something that actually is absent from this movie I never thought of it that way um, and this isn't something that I thought about beforehand, but now that you're bringing it up, I think that maybe sex and partnership is absent because it's really about discovering yourself and loving yourself. And a lot of times um, I've seen the most growth in my life when I was alone, you know, being with a partner, they mirror things back to you. Mm -hmm. And you see again at the end when Ken is, you know, figuring out that he is Kenneth really cannot you know he's having this real breakdown like he almost throws himself off the ledge it's like, i don't know anymore who am i without you you know you can't it's it's not that you can't figure out who you are when you're in a relationship because a healthy relationship will really help you grow mm -hmm. but i think as a person you grow a lot by yourself and i think that that might have been like a big undertone of the movie it's about self-liberation, yeah. right? Like if I had to like think of in our conversation, this is why I love sitting down with you, Shana, is because then I discover aspects of the movie of just being in conversation with you. It is a self-liberation, authentic journey movie. 
and we've never we've never had a movie like this so I don't want to diminish how important this movie is because it is and I think that as a Hollywood movie we haven't seen anything this experimental even like it's a very experimental movie it's very fictional meets the real you don't know if things are real even in the real world like I'm questioning all of the even the workplace like they know that there's a barbie land and like like in the real world you know everyone would think okay i think this whole company they need to be on medication like we need to like give them all something because they're living in a delusion right now um but i was going to bring up though with you the hole in the continuum right like that's something where kate mckinnon's character weird barbie is like oh yeah i know what's happening you know, you're about to get cellulite and it's going to spread all over your body. And then they give her like a going away cellul, get rid of your cellulite party. But it's like the female body, even at the end, we end in the gynecologist's office. So like, why do you think the female body, it is really about the physical, like cellulite, you know, her feet, the gynecologist, like her vagina, like it's all very centered on her understanding of her body i so i actually loved the ending Mm -hmm. um you know you weren't sure you were waiting for her to get out of that car where's she going is she gonna meet a man is she starting her job no she's going to the gynecologist it is this innate womb wisdom and you know i know like maybe your your listeners hearing that are like what is this womb wisdom she keeps talking about (laughs) you know but it's that that innate feminine wisdom and it's also part of it is motherhood that Mm. that brings out this this wild power and so the idea of the womb is that is it it is a space of creativity it's it's empty it's hollow it's it's dark and warm but it is a place where ideas are born and Barbie says to Ruth Handler, she goes, I want to go and, and be the person who has the idea. So she wants to go and she wants to create. Mm-hmm. And again, not necessarily meaning she wants to create life as in a baby, although that could be what she means. She wants to go and create. So that to me, on the deeper level, is what this gynecologist is about. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? Or have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? Then the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie, In addition to the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog. So you can see all of this on glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W.org. Remember, you get 50% off your subscription of the GL Review magazine when you use the promo code ITBR50. That's 50% off your print or digital subscription when you use promo code ITBR50. To learn more about submitting an article for the GNLR, visit their writer's guidelines. The link is located at the bottom of their homepage. And if you have any questions, email Stephen Hemrick. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot H-E-M-R-I-C-K at glreview.org. The GNLR and its readers can't wait to see what you have to say. So womb wisdom then, Sheena, is unlike the way the phrase sounds and practice or the way the study sounds is not always tied inherently to reproduction like it's not about reproduction it's about creation feminine power of creating it's both okay it's both yeah I, there's this really great mudra which if i don't disappear <laughs> is this well you can see my hands popping up Meaning that it doesn't have to be this or that. It is this and that. Okay. So, yes, being a mother is very, very powerful. Um, And it's, again, something that is now women can't say that they want to be a mother. Again, America Ferreira's rant, right? Like, you have to love your kids, but don't talk about it all the time. 
Like there is, um, and to go a little deeper, I'll share with you and your audience. I had a miscarriage recently and thank you. Um, but I was a person, again, I was a Barbie archetype. I (laughs) thought that maybe I would be a great mother, you know, maybe it's not, it's something I never really thought about. I thought if I were to be a mother, that I would be a good mother. And maybe it would be sad if I didn't, but if I didn't become a mother, that's fine. Um, But let me tell you something. When I found out I was pregnant, I had this this really, really deep power that rose up within me. And I thought, wow, like it's a shame that so many women don't want to become a mother because I believe that society has kind of tricked us into thinking we have to be everything but because this is what we fought for. Mm. You know, and that's, you know, (laughs) again, I know I'm going deep, but that's what I do. I think that that's really what the gynecologist scene was all about. And again, you know, you don't have to want to be a mother, you know, and there are some women that have a hard time conceiving, but the womb, yes, there was a lot of power in becoming a mother, but you can mother your career. You can mother your, your creative hobbies. It's feminine energy is where we birth ideas, life. Well, Ruth Handler is the overseeing mother in the film because she created this whole franchise like she created this figure of barbie and so mitch in a way actually is reclaimed at the end like mitch actually gets her saving moment in the gynecologist's office like is not weird anymore or i don't want to say weird because there's weird barbie but she's not discontinued yeah something to be ashamed about like wanting to be like a mitch she's not shameful to Barbie now, like Barbie, who now is, um, I think it's Barbara Handler, yeah, right, is the name she chooses. Yeah. Um, so do you think that this movie argues or even is allowing space for a woman who wants to not have children, who wants to have children, a woman who wants to be sexual, who owns her body, who say a woman who has blonde hair, who says, hey, I want to, you know, own my sexuality. I'm even going to post thirsty photos, but I'm also going to be a doctor. And that's okay. Like whatever I decide, I don't care what society is going to say. And that a woman can be a CEO, but also not be afraid to talk about her body. Because I feel like right now there's still, I know this is such a stereotype. And again, any woman out there who wears pantsuits, this is not like against, like continue wearing what you want to wear. Like I wear what I wear. But I do feel like there is that like businesswoman stereotype of the woman who always wears, like has to look a certain corporate way. Even you see this in politics all the time that rarely do you see like a woman who, you know, has an outfit that could be seen in a sexualized way because they're afraid they're not going to be taken seriously. But what happens if a woman does do that in politics or as a CEO? Mm -hmm. Like, has the movie now liberated or opened up those spaces? It's a complicated question. And my mind goes so many to so many different places. I I don't know if necessarily that that is what the movie is advocating for. I do think it's advocating for be yourself, be your most authentic self and, you know, stop pointing fingers, you know, again, feminism, the pendulum just swung way too far the other way so that like some things are okay and some are not. That's the idea, like regular Barbie, whatever it is that she wants to be. Maybe she is a CEO and a mother, you know, maybe she is a CEO, very sexual. Um, so maybe she's a CEO and has an OnlyFans, but I think our society does deeply judge that. Like I would, like, I do think there is still stigmas around the, like, especially the female body that they're consenting to be sexual, sexual beings. Yeah. So here's what I'll say to that. Um, again, I think everyone should do what they feel is right for them. And I don't think that they need to explain it to anyone else. And I don't think that they need to necessarily 
worry about what other people are doing or if they're shaming them. But I will say, I do personally feel that the female body is very powerful and very sacred. And I do think that like hook up, blah, sorry, hook up culture and birth control has really damaged a lot of women. And I think, again, it's the pendulum. Women's sexuality was suppressed for a really long time. And now women can be overtly sexual. And again, it's an ideology that I think either extreme can be toxic. Mm. Now that's, again, not to say it's for every person, every woman in every case, but I think it's just something to keep in mind. Well, right. And I think I would also, because I know people out there have definitely a wide array of opinions on this. Yeah. And I would say, I don't think we have enough, like why I'm so open and, and empowered about male sexuality, especially queer male sexuality, is because I think a lot of men don't have a language to talk about their sexuality, at least in public. Like when I've posted thirsty photos, the comments I get, I mean, a lot of queer men have positive comments or just people like saying, live your life, Andrew. And I don't listen to the negative, which I don't think anyone, don't let anyone yuck your yum or try to take you down. But I would say that when a man shows off his body, it is still different in our culture. Kind of like, wait, why is a man doing that? Like, it's almost, well, that's supposed to be what women do for men's attention. So I do, but that's kind of why I do enjoy doing it as a thought experiment. Like, hey, I'm putting myself out there. But would you say that the male body is as sacred as you're talking about the female bod body being sacred. Yes, of course, in different ways, right? Like, again, it doesn't have to be this or that. It's this and that. Men are sacred as well, you know? And as far as figuring out a way to express your sexuality for, for the gay culture or for you personally, again, I think, here's the thing, like, ideologies, like, who gives a fuck? Like, do what... <laughs> that's part of the problem I think people are just thinking too much they're just in their head too much like let everyone I am a true advocate for freedom like let everyone do what they feel is right for them and that's what's right for them and that is their journey and you know who are you to shame someone you know it's it's to each their own truly I, I think whatever you want to do is completely fine. The only thing like advice I would ever try to shoot out is just make sure you're having some self-reflection. Like, why is it that you want to do whatever it is that you're called to do? Think about that. Yeah, well, and, you know, as we're getting to the end, which this just went by so quickly, but I feel like you've just offered so much of understanding about, you know, breaking down what womb, womb wisdom is, which I'm sure many out there were like, that's woo woo, but now you've actually shown the layers. I always say that what you might think is um, concocted or something that doesn't fit you when you're hearing things about energies and spirituality, just listen, like listen to what the person is communicating, because this is how I feel even about Marianne Williamson's spirituality is like people have dismissed her as being out of touch, but then now they listen and they say, well, she's advocating for empathy and love, like harnessing love as a power. And in a way, that's kind of when you're talking about womb wisdom, I do feel this movie does really, it wins in the sense of liberation, like in the sense of individuality, you're talking about individual freedom of thought. Yeah. I do think Margot Robbie at the end, we see that's where this is leading. And maybe as a culture, we need to really be doing what we love. Because I think people right now, I always say negativity is bred when people hate what they're doing, mm -hmm. want to take people down because they're jealous, because they see their happiness. Those are our issues. Yeah. Like people who like people who are judging what others wear. I do not, I love, like if you want to wear, you know, you're a guy who wears a crop top, amazing. You know, if you're someone who wears baggy jeans, I don't care. You know, like, that's great. That gives you love, like, power over your body. We should all, all be advocating for individuality, in my opinion. But, um, right, so Margot Robbie has that moment where she says, when America Ferreira has that monologue and it breaks the Barbie's spell, like it breaks um, her being in the patriarchy, that one Barbie. Uh, Margot Robbie says, Sheena, 
Oh, you gave voice to the cognitive dissonance required to be a woman under the patriarchy. So do you think that the monologue, because the monologue has been shared so widely and women have, women, men, you know, non-binary, all gendered people have said that that monologue is one of the most powerful moments they've heard in a movie. Do you think that's true? Or do you think that maybe we're making a mountain out of a molehill? Okay, I'm going to be totally honest, that part annoyed me. <laughs> and everyone in the movie theater clapped. And again, because I have never identified as that. I don't feel that I have really um, struggled with, I mean, of, of course, you know, like I try to be healthy. And of course, I have like looked at my body and wanted things to be different. But I have never really felt any sort of outside pressure. And I, again, they're just ideologies because here's the thing mm -hmm. at any moment. And again, I'm going to go deep. You, a person, you are not anxious. You are not depressed. What you have are anxious thoughts. What you have are depressed thoughts. So again, these are just kind of made up ideologies that have kind of embedded that themselves into our brain and into our culture. But you can at any moment decide that you are not going to be affected by it. Hey, Ivory Tower Boiler Room listeners and true crime friends. You've heard me gush over this incredible woman and her beautiful products. I'm talking about Mandy Made It. Mandy makes customized and original crochet and creek cut goods. They are the perfect, unique, one-of-a-kind gift for literally anyone in your life. And she makes incredible home decor. I still have my pumpkins that I put out every fall. I just love them. Check her out on Instagram at M-A-N-D-E-E -E, Made It or search Mandy Made It on Facebook. To order, just slide into her DMs. And if you mention the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, you will receive a free personalized gift with your first order. So... Go on Instagram and look up at Mandy Made It, and Mandy is spelled M-A-N-D-E-E. -E. Again, her handle is at Mandy Made It, Mandy spelled M-A-N-D-E-E, -E, and order today. So when America Ferreira's character says, never forget that this system is rigged, so the system, what is the system? Like in a in this movie, what is the like what is America for? She's talking about the patriarchy and American culture. Like that's the system. So that the system is rigged. That's actually a really important line. Again, I think these feminine ideologies have been raised to confuse us, men and women. I think this is where my tinfoil hat might fall off. It's the they, the them that want us to be separate and alone and fighting. You present these ideologies that you have to be this or that. And if you don't fit into it, then you're weird Barbie. It breaks us apart and it creates, it creates war between us. It creates this culture war that we're seeing. Yeah, there is an immense, right, right now, even as we're recording, like I only check in with the news, like I'll see updates, but our government is collapsing. I mean, I don't know how to put it, but things are not good in the House and in the Senate. And, you know, there's impeachment inquiries. There's, again, this is not about anyone's specific political belief, but, you know, there's arrests that are being made. This is right now, like I do feel our country is literally, it's been fraying, but this is now our true testing moment as a country. And I feel we can go in two ways. We can either go in like what you're advocating, the empathetic, loving, seeing each other's beauty and power, or what scares me is continuing to divide and conquer and operate in fear and an us versus them mentality. And that I truly hope never takes hold over the majority of people putting down communities. Yeah. So this movie, like coming out right at this moment, 
do you think this movie, like, do you think even the audience clapping, even though you might not have bought the monologue and its power, like you saw, I think though for some in the audience, like even, I wasn't surprised by that monologue because I've been reading that in feminist speeches all during my studies. But I think like if you've never taken a gender course or you never really were exposed to that, like maybe for a woman, that's the first time she heard that message. And she said, wow, maybe I can do my passion that I love. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess, it you know, it's empowering to some. And is that enough? Like, do you think that, again, I don't think a movie is ever going to necessarily be enough to raise consciousness as a whole united front. I mean, because again, this is a Hollywood movie. So, I mean, we could even, I'm sure there are those out there talking about the beauty image of even the women in the movie. Like, these are actresses who are stunning. Like, I mean, every, even Mitch, like, right, Mitch might have a put down, but it's still a hired actress who is, you know, off the charts in terms of her aesthetic. So, mm -hmm. We don't necessarily see everyday women in the movie. Like, I guess America Ferrera's character. But again, we are getting a heightened Hollywood movie. So, I know I offered a lot there. But yeah, in terms of our current culture, like, do you think, in terms of the division, because you did bring up division, do you think that this movie shows us a way out? Hmm. Possibly. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's it's connecting into what's important in life. Man, it's it's just so complicated. Yeah, well, and I guess we do get the Ken's, we get the brainwashing of Ken, you know, thinking he knows what the patriarchy is, which basically, like you said, is Rocky Balboa and Cowboys. Because uh, this is his, like, quick entryway into America and masculinity. But, um at the Century City Mall in Los Angeles. So, but he then realizes, like you said, I do think Ken isn't being talked about as much in terms of how he realizes what he thought was patriarchy is not empowering and helping him in terms of his health and his emotions. He's losing in the system, but he's also losing in the system where he thinks he needs validation from others. Right. So maybe validation, if you need validation from other people, that's a very tribalist bully mentality of I need validation from my group. Like my group needs to validate me instead of why aren't you validating? Yourself? Yeah, well, that would be, you know, you mentioned OnlyFans, like that's part of the problem is social media, right? Like we're just in this culture where we have to be validated. We have to, you know, look for the little um the little hearts that pop up on our Instagram or whatever, like we need that reassurance that we're enough. But you know, like that was the important part of the movie. It's just like you have to figure that out for yourself. You have to, you know. Again, Barbie has her breakdown. She's like, I'm gonna wait for one of the other Barbies. No, nope. baby girl, nobody's gonna save you. You gotta do it yourself. Same thing with Ken. He wants his validation through being with Barbie. No, nope, baby boy, it's gonna. You gotta do it yourself. You know, and he said he realizes that, too, at the end when Barbie's leaving, he's like, thank you, Barbie. Thank you. Like, and that's the important of relationships, too, is that they kind of mirror back what we need to work on within ourselves. Yeah. So I feel like we covered so much. Oh, my God. We covered a lot. And there's a part two for this about I'm going to be joined with a queer theorist friend of ours. Um so if you're like, but Andrew, you didn't talk about all the like homoeroticism and sexuality and like the beach, I'm going to beat you off. Don't worry. I'm going to get into all that. But I really feel, Shana, thank you so much. Like you really gave such gendered analysis, like so many layers, especially the philosophy of finding the pathway yourself. Like I do think that's something we can all carry from this. And everyone listening out there, you all have different political beliefs. Even I know Shana and I, we, you know, don't agree necessarily on every political idea. And we've even like had back and forth in a productive way. But again, I think like us even sitting here together to acknowledge, oh, we have differences, but we have such a beautiful conversation is what I hope happens. Like, I really think a lot of people have lost a way of understanding each other, even though they're different. Like understanding that they can hold different thoughts and still be close. 
And that saddens me. Like that saddens me of where we are in the culture. Yeah. And you know, I don't know, like you were saying before, are we going to split? I think it's quite possible that we may. And you know, it would be terrifying and scary and it would be bad for a while, but who knows, like maybe in the long run, it could be for the best because people can go there like a breakup, right? Super painful, super scary. Am I going to die alone? But you're going to grow from the pain. Well, and all the helpers out there, all the, you know, those who have your spiritual insight, those who operate out of understanding and love, they see each other. Like, I do feel like attracts like people are coming together. So that's the thing in the media that I always want to profess to like cable news is let's highlight the beauty of the communities. Because what I see where I live on Long Island, like walking in Port Jeff, we're just traveling around when I'm in New York City. I'm like, look at all the people, us smiling and having like in Atlantic City, cultures coming together. Like I was on the boardwalk and I'm running and there's an Orthodox Jewish man, there's a woman in a hijab, there's, you know, a Latinx family, there's, I don't know, um, queer couples, but like I saw it all on the boardwalk and everyone is laughing, like having a good time. And I'm like, this is what we do need that represented. Like we need it represented in the media because things are not all in the muck and scary. I would say the majority of our everyday lives, I hope it's more than empowered living. Yeah, and I say all the time, we're all more alike than we are different. And you would think it would make us closer, but a lot of people get lost in the fear and say, well, you couldn't walk through, you know, you couldn't walk a mile in my shoes. Well, I probably could. And, you know, we've all been through fairy. We've all been through death and love and loss and light. You know, we're all more alike than we are different. Yeah. And you know what? I'll end on this, which is there was a beautiful conversation I had with um, her name is Nyala. She um, runs this Middle Eastern market. And I always see her at the her at the farmer's market, Shana. And she's all over Long Island. So if you live on Long Island or in New York City, go to like one of the farmer's markets and you'll see her. And we had this great conversation where I know she is a devout, a devout Christian. And in my own spiritual journey, I now align more with like reform Judaism or just like seeing my Jewish ancestry, even though I was raised Catholic. But like, even though I know that on the way that I live my life might not exactly align with hers. We had this beautiful moment where we just looked at each other and we said, I see what brings you happiness with your religion. And I think it's so beautiful. And she said, I see how passionate you are about what you do. And isn't that beautiful? And we don't have to live the same lives to see that beauty. Who would have thunk? <laughs> and you know, that's why I thank you, Shana. This oh. is so beautiful. And everyone out there, you know, again, these are our own personal opinions and analyses from the movie, but I think this conversation even just shows we have to work through it out loud. And I think so many right now are afraid to say the wrong thing, but maybe we should say our honest thoughts and then hear if someone wants to correct and critique you. Okay, let's be open to the critique, but let's not censor ourselves with language because there are a lot of people right now censoring their thoughts and I'm not an advocate for that. I believe in academic freedom and like freedom of our thoughts. And, you know, we can judge each person's thoughts individually depending on what they're saying. But I just really appreciate how you went there, Shana. And like knowing you're saying things here that a lot in my academic, in the academic community might not agree with, but I think it's good to hear it from your perspective. Yeah, thank you. I was, like I said earlier, you know, off camera, I was nervous to come on here and talk about my viewpoint. Um, you know, being a yogi, I've been, not to go too political, um, I've been liberal most of my life. Um, in more re recent years, I've been considered more conservative in my viewpoints, as you may have heard today. But, you know, I'm still at the end of the day for freedom for people expressing themselves however they want to. And I believe everyone should have that right. And, you know, I'm just, you know, who, who cares what someone else wants to do? Just, yeah. there's so much love. Well, man. And if we yeah. only operate in our own echo chamber and in our own silo, we're seeing what happens when people only listen and have their own thoughts reflected back at them. You lose touch with um, those who are around you, you know, because 
life doesn't operate only in your social media sphere. I love social media and I love like promoting the podcast. Don't get me wrong. But like, I think also when you allow yourself to be who you are on social media, it comes through, like to be open about your life. So Shana, this is beautiful. I can't wait to continue like our chatting with each other. Yeah. Um. So everyone out there, how can they fi- find you, find your services? So my Instagram is I am Shana Marie. There's underscores. I underscore am underscore Shana Marie. And my website is Shana Marie wellness.com. Okay. Well, I hope a lot, you know, start following you, ask you about more about womb wisdom. And I'm just fascinated, like learning as an amateur of what that even is. So this is wonderful being with you. Okay. Well, Bye, everyone out there. Have a great day. And, you know, maybe you should go for, maybe you're listening to us as you're walking. But if not, maybe now is a good time to go for a walk. (laughs) Yes. Bye, everyone. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby. I want to thank you so much for listening to the ITBR and TCIA episodes. Make sure if you don't, Follow, rate, and review us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Also, make sure you follow ITBR on TikTok and Instagram at Ivory Tower Boiler Room and TCIA on TikTok and Instagram at True Crime and Academia. Also, we have a brand new Patreon membership system. So I just want to explain it to you all quickly. So if you want to become an ITBR student, it is $5 a month. You get ad-free ITBR and TCIA episodes and video interviews. If you want to become an ITBR professor for $10 a month, you get all of those ad-free benefits, but you also get access to both the ITBR and TCIA book clubs. You can join both book clubs, get ad-free episodes, plus you're going to get all of our extra video episodes. So I am re-watching Queer as Folk. Christian Garcia from That Old Gay Classic Cinema is joining us, and he's re-watching Smash. Um, Mary is going to start to re-watch shows as well. You even get access to what I'm calling the ITBR teaches. So if I'm recapping a movie or a TV show, including Barbie, um, Halloween movies and horror films, you get access to that as well. And then I also am offering consultation services. So for $30, you get your first initial consultation with me. It's a one hour private Zoom. I will help create a, your podcast, your media brand. How do you navigate academia as an undergrad or a grad student? Do you need help with technology? It could be teaching tools, Spotify for podcasters, video editor software. Do you want to expand your social media presence as an artist, writer, podcaster, or academic? Do you want help on how to create a public humanities identity like I've created for myself? So I now I'm offering that consultation service. You can find more info about it on Patreon. And you also can join our book clubs. If you want to just join the ITBR book club or the TCIA book club, you can do that for $4 a month patreon.com backslash ivory tower boiler room that is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash ivory tower boiler room thanks to the team mary de pippi our chief contributor and thank you to our two new interns from stony brook university jonathan and sarah bye everyone until next time